Well, Gaurav, it's quite a privilege to be um, chatting with you today. Um, look, I mean, I think Muda is the number one car site in Malaysia by far. Um, number two property site in Malaysia. Carousel is uh, a, a favorite among many people, my wife included. Um, you, and having, having uh, um, raised Series C from a bunch of investors, including Sequoia, uh, Telenor, uh, Tomasek and, and you know other blue chip investors are that you have been instrumental in shaping the direction and steering the ship in terms of new business uh, organic and acquisitions for Carousel. You are by far and away a, a, a unicorn and uh, we look forward to your listing in the not too distant future. So maybe we can start off by hold the whole discussion in terms of you reading the landscape in, in Asia, how you're shaping the e-commerce marketplace because it's, it's, if, it's moving very fast, right? And secondhand is your thing. You don't do new. Secondhand is what you're trying to do in terms of uh, Murad's business plan. Can, can you talk about your, your thinking behind why you've moved the ship in this direction? Um, so first of all, thank you for having me here. And I'm quite honored to be uh, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs here, specifically because I'm a failed one. I failed at my first maiden venture uh, around 10, 11 years back. Since then, I've become an entrepreneur versus an entrepreneur. So a huge respect for all the entrepreneurs and the hardships they have to go through. I only was able to be at it for one year, or one and a half years. So thank you for having me here. Um, why did we decide to steer the ship, you said? Uh, I'll, I'll just say, so we never decided to steer the ship in a different direction. We always had uh, a one direction in mind, which is about how to make Secondhand, the first choice. So we always, from day one, the focus of the company has been on secondhand. It's never been on new. Uh, and that's because uh, there is an immense business opportunity uh, in this space. As e-commerce grows, as people start consuming more, as more urbanization happens, as consumption increases, space in houses becomes lesser. As space becomes lesser, people also need to get rid of the things that they've had in the past. So that's one. So there is an immense business opportunity in the circular economy, in recycling goods, in extending the life of uh, item that you have had at home. Then there is a purpose that you end up doing to the earth. Right? So there's a sustainability element to this that we also have believed in from day one, that you can actually improve the lives of future generations by being able to extend the life of goods and you know, not have everything going to landfills as quickly as it would have otherwise. So you've been able to wrap Marie Kondo, ESG, and Amazon into one model, which is very convenient for the times. And that's three turbocharged engines right there. Um, in terms of the current um, volatility in the market, Gaurav, and I see you are smiling now, right? <laughs> because obviously, operationally, I'm sure it must be very interesting for me from a growth perspective. Um, can you tell, tell me about the, the, the difficulties or, or the not difficulties of of navigating the last eight months, which have been very, very troublesome for e-commerce and technology firms in general. How, how have you overcome that? I think I'll quote here one of our advisors who, who works closely with us. So we have Colin Breyer, who, is, uh, uh, who was the chief, uh, chief of staff for Jeff Bezos at Amazon for a long period of time. He's one of our advisors. Uh, and there's something that he constantly helps us focus on, and that's really the controllable inputs and that's really what it, it ultimately means, is you don't focus on the externalities that you cannot control. And those will happen, those are constraints to work with. Anything that's happening, Ukraine war, we can't change. That's happening in terms of inflation, we can't change. What we can do is what is in our control. So how do you focus on what's in your control, and how do you adapt to make the best of the situation? I think that's where our focus is. Uh, generally, when inflations go up and when uh, things tighten in the economy, second hand actually is a better choice for people. So our business is generally more immune to uh, inflationary trends uh, overall. Uh, but I, I would say the focus is more on what we can control versus what's happening around us. So just, a, just maybe one or two minutes of your time in terms of dealing with one of the big geopolitical issues now in town, which is the supply chain, or the constraints of delivery and logistics. How have you overcome that in terms of just maintaining customer satisfaction? You can't, right? Uh, if there are no cars on the road and cars cannot be supplied, the cars are not there. 
and I'll take example of cars because that's been hit a lot today. So the amount of wait for a car in Malaysia is anywhere from six to nine months uh, to get a new car. Majority of the second-hand cars are replacement cars on the market. So if you don't have new cars coming in, supply of used cars also is difficult to get by, which means if a person wants to buy a car, there's less supply available. And you can't do much about it in that context. But what you can do is, how do you address people's concerns about the existing inventory that's there? How do you focus on areas where there's an opportunity? So for example, right now, there's a much bigger opportunity in jobs. There's, that's a segment, there's many more, uh, there's much less uh, supply of, uh, sorry, there's much less supply of employers, there's many more jobs going around. And that's a, a, a deficit that is existing. So we're focusing on that, because that's another advantage of being a horizontal player, where you have multiple categories on a platform. So today we can focus at this moment on building the jobs category, because that's where the demand and supply constraints uh, are more matching. Uh. Right. So the founders of Carousel, uh, three guys, I think, uh, two from Singapore, one Malaysian, they met at a uh, kind of like a, a startup event in Silicon Valley 12 years ago, 2015, right? So a few weeks ago, we spoke to Lloyd Tony of Farm Fresh, and Farm Fresh essentially, uh, he, I think he started the business when he was in his early 40s. He's taken about 17 years to build it to where it is now, and it's become a kind of like an almost a ringgit. Well, it's definitely a ringgit unicorn, but maybe almost a dollar unicorn. Not sure. You, in 10 years, via your inputs and your ability to scale in the region, have become a, a, a multi, probably a multiple dollar unicorn. I know you can't share valuation with me, right? So you've taken half the time to grow maybe three or four, four times the size of Farmfresh in the technology e-commerce space. What does it take to scale at hyperspeed like that? Um, the first, I think, about our founders, um, they did not meet first time in Silicon Valley. They actually studied together at NUS and then Sorry. went to Silicon Valley together for an overseas uh, uh, program. But uh, coming back to uh, your question particularly, uh, I think for us, valuation is not, the, is not the focus. As I said, it's not controllable, right? What we can control is what we do for our users, what we obsess about our users. And that's really also the answer to your question on how did we get fast to this space is about really obsessing about the user experience, about trying to solve a unique problem that others are not solving. So nobody's solving the second-hand problem in that, uh, with that much of depth, with that much of focus that we are trying to solve. And as you pick up a space where there are not many other people trying to solve the problem, you also build a huge moat by just learning and doing things which are much earlier in the um, space than what competition is doing. So by default, by that um, choice, uh, I think we managed to grow. Well, sounds good, Gaurav, but a few years ago when we started using Carousel, the reason why we started using Carousel is because it's free to use, right? Um, there are no platform fees as opposed to the Lelongs and whatever of this world, right? Um, so you, you were able to get a lot of people onto the platform fast, but there were a lot of bugs in the system, and that was a real issue some years ago, right? For a startup with, I think at the time, limited capital to, to spend on you know, a back end, how, how did you deal with that? Because, because you've got to keep it up, right? You've got to keep the site online and active. You can't come down, right? So how do you deal with all that at the time? So, so you're not wrong that you need to have some capital in space if you're not going to earn capital at that point. So I think we've been very um, blessed by having the investor who believed in our long-term vision to be able to give that capital for us to build a business on which we can actually monetize and get something. So I think in that context, it's a lot about having the right kind of capital strategy and getting the right investors who don't believe in just the short term, who are there for the long term, for your strategic vision, and they help you empower your journey forward. So I think a lot of that has been um, based on um, uh, ability to have attracted those investors and have kept them on board since then. Well, from day one, it's not easy to get Sequoia or Tomasic on board, right? So from 2015 onwards, I'm sure there's been a lot of you know, bootstrapping in the early years, right? Um, when you talk about getting the right capital structure, especially for you know, companies in the zero to five, zero to seven year you know, age uh, maturation levels, how do, you, how do you answer those questions? To get the right amount of capital in, to be able to pay for the back end, to get the customer experience up and, and to a certain level, how do you do that? Uh, so let me talk about Muda in this case, uh, particularly. Because Muda was in this situation six, seven years back. 
uh, where it was um, burning cash and not making money and capital was difficult to come about and how would you actually turn the business into a sustainable, profitable growth business versus something that is just growing in terms of number of users and not churning enough returns back or free cash flow to be able to grow on its own. Ultimately, uh, I do believe that you have to move towards a destiny where you can actually have enough free cash flow to be able to invest in your growth. And that's what we did for Muda, is to actually choose where we could end up monetizing, where our experience was good enough for us to be able to monetize. So ultimately, um, earning money is a difference between the willingness uh, or the value you create for users and the willingness they have to pay for that value. Right? So you have to create a higher value than what they're willing to pay you for, and then you'll be able to monetize it. So we decided to start monetizing areas where we were creating more value, and to be able to then balance growth in terms of just user growth with um, getting the company to profitability so that we could sustain future investments to grow. And that's something we are now doing across our markets, which are in mature stage, they are generally profitable, earning positive EBITDA, and investing that cash into earning, to growing new markets and new, new business models. So in specific terms, how did Muna modern, monetize what it was doing at the time? I, I know Carousel, you're selling advertising, which took away from the customer experience, let's be honest, right? But it was, an, it was a sacrifice that we as users were willing to face. How did you monetize Muda? You would be surprised. Muda charges around 20 ringgit from car dealers to post a car. And that itself can get us to profitability. Because we bring so much of value to those car dealers, they use us always, the property agents use us so many times. So we do not end up charging the private individual, the casual individuals, we end up charging people who are trying to make business off us. Right? So, and that's not advertising revenue, so we help them sell cars, we help them sell property, we help them help employers find jobs, and that's where we charge them. And as a result of that, we are able to make a business that's profitable. So a bit of a Robin Hood strategy, the rich guy pays for the poor guy. But then in terms of um, just always keeping liquid, right? I'm, I'm sure as with most startups, you're constantly raising capital, right? Um, talk about those experiences in those days. What kind of experiences did you go through? I, I guess uh, it's, it's difficult to raise capital, uh, but it's easy to raise capital when you have capital. So I, I would say that's been one of the experiences. When you don't have capital, people don't want to invest in you because they are not sure uh, of the, or the risk to, of their capital to give a return. If you're only relying on their capital, it increases. But if you have enough capital and you can succeed without their capital, they're willing to give you more. Right? Because you might, they have, think to, it's you might have to explain that again, okay? <laughs> Granularity. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, what we figured out is that when uh, investors feel that you have enough capital to succeed on your own, they are willing to put more capital in you because they see their capital giving the return, chances of their capital giving return increase. So how does the capital starved startup show to investors that it's got enough capital? Because it's kind of like a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like, how do you put the cart before the horse? Because you've got to have the cart first, right? So how do most startups in the region, in fact the world, who are capital starved? So that's a slightly different situation. So let's go to the capital starved scenario. So in capital starved scenario, it's a lot about uh, getting in the right investor who believe in your vision, who believe in your long-term strategy. So if you can find those right investors who are willing to travel with that journey, that's the, way, that's the place we find, at least we have found success in, because we were in early stages able to find investors in 500 startups, in Secure Capital, in Rakutan, who believed in us, and has been that constant um, backbone for us to grow, to come to a stage where we can then bring other investors in and grow to the next stage. Did it help that you were in a sexy space and there were proven success models in America and, and Europe? Did it help? What about for, for some of them who are trying to break new ground in, in complete new business models? I think it did help us that we had uh, um, analogs in different countries. It was easier for investors to imagine what we could become because there were success case studies in Scandinavia, in Europe, in New Zealand, etc. And they could then understand. So it became easier in that context. So I do believe that when you have such examples, it's a slightly easier job. 
if you are in an absolutely um, virgin area where nobody has done, I imagine it would be difficult. I've not had the personal experience of trying to do it in that space, uh, but I would imagine it would be more difficult. But again, I would also, uh, you know, respect a lot of our VCs and inspect, uh, investors who have that nose and ability to see where the next future uh, is going, what is that business model that actually they should be supporting. They are also very experienced. So I think they also, if you really have something that's good, uh, they will be able to judge that. Okay, so headquartered as you are in Singapore, Gaurav, you would have access to sophisticated investors who know what they're doing, who have seen case studies from around the world, and who do have patience because their balance sheet allows for it, right? A lot of co companies in Malaysia, they don't have that luxury. Uh, and many detractors in the startup space in Malaysia have said the investors here have neither the knowledge nor the experience or the, the patience. Now, how would you advise you know, ca capital staff startups you know, to, to raise capital when you're faced with those challenges? Uh, I, I honestly have had less experience in it because um, I have not had to face that scenario early enough. So should they move uh, to Singapore? Or they can rely on Endeavor. J joking, joking. <laughs> I was going to say Endeavor and Endeavor type of organizations is where they could rely on uh, to actually build the case and start attracting those investors. Okay, so let's take it to the next level, right? So if you try and join Endeavor to get some assistance, you must qualify for Endeavor. What if you're early stage and you don't qualify for Endeavor? Then what happens? You know, you're building a model, you're forging new ground, and Amazon was a pioneer you know, 25 years ago, right? Um, how do you overcome that? Because you could be changing the world, but you can't pay for it. Then what happens? That's the reason I had to stop my startup. I was in Singapore. I, I couldn't find investors. I couldn't uh, uh, bootstrap it beyond that, and I had to stop it. So, so yes, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, it's just that um, I'm not sure I really have a good answer for you on that, honestly, because I have not been able to succeed at that. What I can talk a little bit about from the experience that this Carousel co-founder Suresh is with us, I, I can quote him a bit. Um, he quotes this that, uh, you know, if somebody asks him, what is the favorite animal you have to be in this context? Uh, he quotes that he would love to be a cockroach. Cannot die, is it? Cannot die, is very swift, is very adaptable, uh, thrives in extreme conditions, is able to, you know, survive till the time you're able to prove and you're able to go ahead and, and find that right investor to go. A lot of businesses, in his opinion, die not because they're bad, because they couldn't find the right investors at the right time. So his advice, whenever we talk about this topic, has been is to become a cockroach, find ways to survive and thrive, act swiftly, adapt, change, uh, be thrifty about things, till time you can find that right investor who believes in you and take, take you to the next level. But if you don't survive, then you don't have a business to grow. So that's what at least I can talk about from the experience he shared with us. I have not had the experience of uh, really struggling to raise cash at the zero to one level. I've lot been involved in one to 100 and uh, five to 100 uh, level in startups right now. Okay, so let's move on to the other operational headache, right, for management, uh, people. People to drive the business in technology, to build the back end, to keep it running, to keep it up time and all that side, right? UX, UI, big headache, right? And sales and marketing, big headache, you know, obviously platform management, big headache. Um, how are you hiring? How did you hire uh, with alacrity in the early years so that you didn't spend too much time in, you know, like, um, um, you know, um, wasted dead ends? How, how did you, how do you advise startup managers to hire right? What kind of things do you look for? Where, where are your sources? Because headhunting firms, you know, they're not very good either. I think first thing is to be clear about what do you want to hire for? Who do you want to hire for? What skill sets you want to hire for? Right? Um, and we found this over a period of time, experimenting, to actually to be able to create the right kind of job description internally, right? that this is exactly the person I'm trying to hire for. This is the, qualifi this is the skill sets I'm trying to hire for. Once you get to that good knowledge of skill set you're trying to hire for, also knowing that uh, th then it is more about that you're not trying to hire a person like yourself. So you, then you start considering diversity into play. Right? 
so that you can then try and expand the, uh, the set of opinions, the set of competencies that are coming into the organization. That was, I think, important in our early days, is as important now too, right? Um, and I think that has helped us uh, in trying to really think about these two things. Spend time on deciding what really is the job description you want this person to do. What are the skill sets that are required to do the job description? The clearer you are about it, the clearer you can evaluate the candidate for it in the first place. And second, trying hire for diversity is somebody who can add value, can do things you can't do, so that that person's opinions are not just a reflection of you, they're not just an extension of you, and are helping you move forward. I think those two um, basic principles, I think, have held us uh, um, quite good over the last uh, many years. I'm assuming you've been through the hiring process and interviewed hundreds, maybe thousands of people, right? Um, have, you, have you managed to institutionalize a process or formalize a process where maybe, you know, you spend... Okay, so I was listening to, to Brian Armstrong, the, Co the Coinbase CEO, right? He said past his hi 500th hire, he had to really be quite disciplined about how many, how many minutes he spent with each hire, what kind of questions he had to ask, and even the whole um, em potential employee experience. Because if he didn't hire the guy, he didn't want the guy to go on and say, oh, Brian Armstrong's a bit of a dick. Do you know what I mean? So that, that whole experience has to be managed as well. How, how, what's your process for hiring? What questions do you ask? What's your process? We, we managed to institutionalize this process, I think, to a certain extent by now. Um, uh, and it starts with the hiring brief. Um, which, again, I think it goes, keeps on going back to first principles. If you're not clear about your problem, you cannot find the right solution. So spending time on the problem is much more important than the solution. So we do spend a lot more time on the hiring brief. Who are the people who are going to actually interview the person? What skill set specifically each of the interviewer is looking for? We normally have a skill task that we also want the interviewer to do. Uh, and each of the interviewers has a specific task that they have to fulfill. So they are generally checking different aspects of the candidate, including competency, including uh, culture, and all other uh, related things that we would like to have in the organization. And then these, once a set of four to five interviewers have met this candidate, they would sit together for a debrief. If all of those interviewers do not say yes to the candidate, that candidate is not hired. So. It's extremely important in the st uh, to get the right candidates into the organization and then give them the right opportunity to succeed. Uh, but I think that's been a process uh, um, to actually raise the bar in hiring every time we're trying to hire candidates. So being clear about the JD is one side, right? But addressing a thin supply of talented people out there is the other part of which you've got no control, less of buying a couple of universities yourself. So how do you address that? Do you go overseas? Do you nurture from within? What what you do? I think we do all of the above. Um, so first, there are certain places. So you have a, a North Star of the candidate you want. Right? Uh, it's not likely that you may find exactly that same person, which means the person may be good in certain things, but certain things may have to be um, trained or may have to be learned over a period of time. So you try and see if the person has potential to learn those things and, and, and then create an environment where a person can actually grow into that role. So one is that option. There'll be certain roles where you cannot afford to hire a person who doesn't have that skill set. A lot of it comes into the engineering roles. There you actually end up finding the right person. If you can't, you end up having the right consultants advise you till the time you can find the right person. Because it's just so important to take right decision, foundational decisions there that uh, if you don't have the right candidate, uh, you suffer a lot later. So it depends on the function, it depends upon uh, talent available, and sometimes you do have to search uh, globally uh, for those talent. And for those that you uh, have already hired, right, assuming that for the most part you make the right decision, how do you ensure that they keep motivated to keep on performing to the metrics that you want them to, um, and you know, to, to obviously keep delivering? How do you keep them motivated especially in a private structure, which you still are, right? How, how do you keep doing that? It's tough. Uh, it's tough because you hire for diversity, right? Uh, and uh, well, 
I have all these uh, things now that we are talking about this. Let me put one of our culture element that we use for this purpose. Sorry. I'm going to put this up here. Um, so we hire for diversity. Uh, and diversity is extremely difficult to manage. And why I put up here, I'll just explain it. Because uh, one way to manage people when they come in is about uh, the kind of culture that you create in the organization. And that's an important part. But as you have diversity, there are differences in people. And this is one of the behaviors that we try and encourage. And we have this thing called a palm of the hand with a heart in between. That, that's really what I'm wearing up here. Um, which is about actually learning to respect differences, respect diversity, because what that diversity brings is more valuable for them than the problems it creates. When you're hiring people that are not same type, you will clash on thoughts, because you are different. Your personalities are different, your thoughts are different, but if people realize that that difference is the value you're bringing to the table, then it's easy to accept. So what kind of diversity works in an e-commerce marketplace? Because when you talk about diversity, it can be very different. We, we're oft, oftentimes, the fallback is gender diversity or racial diversity, but diversity is many, many things. It can be age diversity, it can be economic diversity, it could be educational diversity, it could be cultural diversity, it could be, you know, I mean, would you hire a Somalian over a Singaporean? Likely not, right? So what diversity metrics work in a, in a technology startup? Technology company, no longer startup. Uh, for me, diversity is skill sets. Right? The first part of diversity is skill set. Gender, age is the next stage. Right? But if the skill sets are not diverse, if the opinions are not diverse, so skill sets and opinions are the two things, if they are not diverse, then you're not most likely hiring right. So that's the diversity we're talking about. Skill sets and personalities. So if you're hired to build a back end for Carousel, how diverse can your skill set set? Because you can't hire a journalist to build a back end, right? Well, I'm not talking about a function within a function, right? So you can hire a skill set of, uh, so there is a certain competency that you need in order to be able to, let's take back end. So if you're creating a back end on a certain language, you need a language as a competency to do that and your experience in them. Now that becomes like a hygiene factor. Beyond that hygiene factor, you look for the personality and the opinions that person is building. A way to write the code is not same for every single individual, even if the language is same. Right? So you want to see then people who are able to think differently, are able to write a code in a way that it actually is breaking boundaries, able to collaborate with others while writing it. Right? Because that code is not going to be most likely written individually. It's, it is likely written in pairs with group of people, and it's over time has to be maintained by others. So you start looking for those things, people who can, who are not just like individual heroes, who can also work with others, yet they are good at the task they're doing, for example. Culture, right? Second end is a culture within, within Carousel. I must, it must be one of them, right? Uh, diversity must be a cultural trait as well. How do you make sure in a fast growing, you know, obviously you must have a couple thousand people by now, group wide across the region, right? How do you make sure that culture is transferred along and preserved? It's difficult. Um, why? Because culture is not just, so I, I'll tell you the different dimensions of cultures as we think. So cultures is the three dimensions of culture. There is a corporate culture, there is a location culture, and there is a functional culture. Different functions require different things to be done. What is culture? Culture is just informal behaviors that guide you to do certain things without you having to put rules. Cultural is a, is a way you um, fine-tune the body language of the organization, the way you end up um, not creating 100 rules that this is the way things are done here. People feel this is the way to do things and hence make the right decisions. And that hence is dependent on a function. Different functions have slightly different aspects of culture. Different countries have a contribution to what the culture is. And then there is a corporate culture. So the way we work is we look at the corporate culture at the top level, then we let each country and each functional customize it to their version so that they are working in a kind of a constraint, but they're adapting it to each function, each country's specific needs in that scenario. And again, it's not about values. 
because those outcomes is the behaviors you encourage, is the behaviors you focus on which actually create the culture in the end. So we look at behaviors. So culture creation, is it a conscious process or is it an organic process? It is a, a very deliberate process that you take part in. You just don't have control over the outcome. Right? Culture is almost like a brand uh, wherein it's, it's what is in minds of users and minds of employees and the way they're doing it. You try and make it to a certain level, but what you do doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually behaving like that. So ultimately, culture is judged based on not just what you do, but how people are reacting to it and what they are making. So in that context, um, it's, uh, it's a deliberate process, but you cannot assume whatever you are doing deliberately is indeed what is actually happening on ground. Okay, so we talk about culture a lot, right, in, in management circles, but why does culture matter? Why does it, does it have a tangible, you know, relatable, you know, quantifiable value, whether in shareholder value or whether it's in um, operational value or profitability value? Why, why does culture matter? Why, why shouldn't you just do business and just make money? To me, culture matters a lot, uh, and I'll tell you why, uh, in my opinion especially in the industries I work in or I've worked in, um, there have been very people-led industries. So let's take technology. So you create technology, engineers that are creating technology uh, or solutions for users, they're not, uh, it's not a manufacturing process, not a process that can be um, uh, machinized only. So there is a human being behind it that is actually doing a lot of thinking and a lot of creation. Ultimately, we are a people's business. We are managing people who then create the right kind of solutions for consumers and users. And if you start thinking you're a people's business in the first place, every individual that comes in brings in a different facet. Human beings are not same. They may be same age group. They may have grown up together. They may be even siblings or twins, but they're not same. Right? And that is where uh, what culture does it, it gives them a sense of purpose, a way to act together in a group in what they understand what's acceptable in an organization like this, what is not acceptable. It takes away the need to create archaic rules for everything. It hence empowers people to make decisions, empowers people to act in a way that they can make progress without having to really look at a rule book on what you have to do. So that's where culture is very empowering. It enables people to act across the organization creates distributed leadership, which you cannot create if you are setting rules and everything comes down from top. And that's where culture is very empowering. Okay, so you went, um, I, growth for you became inorganic some years ago, right? I think the last four years or so. You bought Muda, you bought stuff in Vietnam, and you know, I, I'm, I can't even remember half the, <laughs> half the assets you own now. When, you, when you're growing as fast as that, inorganically, right? How do you transfer culture to another business which has its own culture originally? We are learning. <laughs> um, so one thing uh, I think we've been quite conscious of, uh, when we've been buying companies, we just don't look at their financials. We look at the purpose. We look at the way they are actually growing. What is their culture? And if we find a fit in it, that plays an important part in our decision making. Right? So it's not just that this company is great financially, they do because ultimately what is our role? If the companies we are acquiring, are they supposed to add a competency to the overall group or they're supposed to be independent organizations doing something totally different? Most of our acquisitions are some things that are going to add value to the overall platform and the group as we grow. And in that context, we try and choose companies that are not just financially going to help us or bring a competency that we need. They're also going to add or have directionally the same cultural aspects. They may be defining it differently, uh, but it's not like we are trying to go towards Japan, that they are trying to go towards London. That is not a scenario that would be acceptable to us normally. So what are the top three things you consider when um, in acquisitions? Is it, are you buying revenue? Are you buying competencies? Are you buying people? Are you buying geography? What, what are you buying when you buy stuff? 
I think it depends upon uh, a particular acquisition and what acquisition strategy is. For us right now, especially during COVID, the way we pivoted, our acquisition strategy has been much more on... Uh, so I think there have been two phases, if I just think about. Uh, there was a time when we were expanding into geographies, and that's where Muda and Chotot and some of these entities were bought, where we got a much bigger footprint in Malaysia, Vietnam, Myanmar, that Caruso originally did not have. So that was about expansion into geographies. The current state of expansion that we're doing is capabilities. As we are trying to, um, we are in this stage of being ambidextrous uh, in the sense that we are trying to evolve our business model from what it currently is into a slightly different business model. So give different choices to users. Uh, as we've discovered in second hand, one of the biggest things that users, uh, that's preventing from next stage of users, the next set of users to come in and join us, has been um, assurance of quality of second-hand items. Right? So if people can't be sure of the quality of item they're buying, they don't want to come out and buy second-hand items. So we want to make second-hand equal to first choice. We want to be able to give them assurance of that quality. So a lot of our acquisitions in the last two years have been on that uh, premise as to where can we build capabilities to actually provide that solution to users where they can trust the item that they're buying. Now, in this case, um, it's a capability acquisition. And because it's a capability acquisition, there's different kind of things that we are thinking of. OK, capital management, right? Um, up until quite recently, it was all about valuations and raising the best value possible, right? Then the transition to profitability, the path of profit became much more paramount. Um, in Carousel's thinking, right? Uh, as you move further along, along the journey, um, what is your capital management strategy? Um, are, are you moving more towards uh, you know, making sure that profit I is achieved earlier, or are you still trying to get as much bounce for your, for your valuation as possible? So first, uh, I, I think valuation to again is an outcome. We don't start with valuation in mind. It is important when we discuss with investors, it's important when we discuss there, but that's not something that we obsess about every day in our work. Right? Um, and now, so that's the outcome of what you create. The second thing is, what is driving valuations is what you're saying. Sometimes profitability is driving, other times revenue growth is driving, and, and, and that's, that's a reality. So stock markets have been, and investors have been looking at differently, um, and that has changed dramatically over the last 12 months or so. Uh, but again, we go back to the first principles here. Right? We believe profit or loss or whatever cash burn you're doing is a constraint to work with. That's a scenario that it's, it's a given, and we've got to find best ways to manage that. And that depends upon the cash you have, depends on which market you are and what maturity stage you are. And when it comes to where we want to focus our energy in the organization is about creating value for users and monetizing that value, right? Creating value and capturing value. If we're able to create value and capture value, we will grow in profitability. It may be that in certain markets we are profitable, other markets we're not because we're investing in them. If we have a constraint on cash or capital, we may invest in less markets at a certain point in time, right? But it still doesn't change our overall approach that where we have to invest our time in is where we create value for users, and as we're creating that value, where we can actually capture that value back for the business. Rest of the scenarios are outcomes that we don't obsess about every day in what we do. So for a second-hand marketplace for yourself, like yourself, what amounts to value for the user? Is it speed? Well, I'll let you tell me. What amounts to value? I, I think the first thing that's valuable for users is that a second-hand item is much cheaper than a new item. It's, it's less costly if I look at a buyer perspective. The item is much less costly, and if it's in a good condition, you're paying almost half of the new item. Right? Let's take an example of an iPhone, for example. Can you compel your, you, your, your merchants to sell at a lower price? You can't, right? You can't. So, so how do you make sure that the second-hand iPhone is cheaper by magnitude, order of magnitude, than the new one? So what happens is that this is the beauty of marketplaces, right? Uh, Marketplace is not owned by one merchant. 
Okay, so the surface, the cheaper ones. Big, no, you you have all merchants there, right? Everybody is there. People are searching. People search for cheaper items. People search for items that are giving value. If you are giving item that's much is not valuable, people are not going to buy it. People are not going to respond to you. You, as a merchant, learn, or as an individual who is also selling, learn that I have to sell it at this price in order to get the item sold. And we then empower them by giving them idea about trends, about what prices are there for each item, or could they price it in order to sell it. Uh, but the merchant learns or individual learns very quickly because they don't get responses to those items. Okay, so that's quite intuitive. Price is one thing. Price, uh, val price value, right? What about quality? How do you, how do you offer the image of, um, you know, how do you t show users that the stuff on sale for, on your platform is quality? It's not bust or dented or whatever, right? So, so this is, uh, so in the past, this was about giving signals to people. And hence, the model was very much based on meetup. Right? So you would give signals depending upon the kind of sellers that's there, what they've done in the past, their quality, et cetera. Those signals were given to sellers, the pictures and the quality of pictures, where the dents are, where the problems are, were uh, shown to users. And the users actually met to be satisfied with the item they're buying. And that's how it used to be. That's why. Uh, marketplace online, uh, second-hand models, second-hand marketplaces were very localized in nature and were operating in small, you know, city areas, etc. because people could meet each other to actually solve this problem. Uh, with technology, with other options, now what we're trying to solve with cross-border across many markets, across cities, where items could be shipped to you. Uh, and, and this is where being able to, for the platform to be able to provide a trust, uh, a certain guarantee, a certain optionality for users to actually um, understand. For example, if you're buying a Hermes bag or a Louis Vuitton bag, you don't want to buy a knockoff. You want to know that it's actually genuine. And if you're going to pay $40,000 for it, for example, it is a genuine um, uh, Hermes bag that you're buying. So this is where we've started something new. And this is these are the capabilities I was talking about. So we now have authenticators in some of these categories. So we have people who actually inspect a bag check it and actually um, are able to give an authentication certificate that this Hermes bag is actually genuine. If it's not, we take the uh, guarantee for it for you. Yeah, that's a new model for you because you're trying to be the custom of luxury handbags and you're also doing clothing. So that was an acquisition for you, right? Because I think you told me about it in the holding room. Um, what kind of volumes are you seeing there though? Because um, I'm sure it must be quite hard to sell a Birkin. You know, 40,000, that's four times the price of a Kanchil, right? It is, it is, and uh, it's early days. Um, we seeing, uh, so why we did it? Because this is where uh, our users were telling us this is what they need. And actually, if you look at Carousel, Carousel has one of the highest GMVs in second-hand bags in markets like Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, the amount of people- Gross merchandise value. Yeah, gross merchandise value actually, who were actually doing transactions using our platform, but the actual transaction was happening offline when they were meeting up. So there was a huge market already. So we actually knew there was a market. Now what we're doing is we're being in capabilities to authenticate these items and increase that market. Right? So this is just a starting level. So uh, like the authentication of bags, et cetera, started a couple of months back, and we are now going to market with it. So the numbers are very initial stages yet, but we're seeing some very healthy signs. And it's not just bags. We're doing it for mobile phones soon. We're doing it for, we're actually doing it for cars too. So in Singapore, we actually buy cars and sell cars like a car some would do here. Uh, and we are doing it for uh, uh, clothes. You could actually you know, send your, um, you could empty your closet. You just need to fill a bag, empty your closet, and send it to us. And we would pay you certain money for those uh, uh, clothes that you've gotten rid of. So what does it take to keep going into new businesses like you have, um, you know, to, to, to fund them, to strategize them, to run them? Because they sound like slightly different business models, run in slightly different ways. And that must be quite a challenge for your investors because they put in money into you. Some, some of them have been there for more than five years, right? Oh, longer. Yeah, yeah. longer, right? So how do you traverse that, that whole uh, investor management journey, which I'm sure you go through? Sure. Uh, there are two parts here, right? One, um, is it different? Yes, it is different. We've been generally a platform business, and we've learned the platform part, but we've not done the offline handling of this, the offline operations, of buying a bag, holding a bag, or a phone. You've not done that. So what we've tried to do in this case is we've tried to buy 
competencies or people who are already doing it. So that's where a lot of our acquisitions have gone. So we've tried to both incubate internally and buy the competency. Uh, and as we experiment on these two, we will potentially find the right path. So there's a bit of experimentation. Uh, we've also decided that we are maybe we were not the best at it, right? So trying to build up everything organic would have taken it much more time, which is why we uh, wanted to acquire those capabilities. Uh, these are not done in isolation. This is done with support of our investors. So investors believe this is the right model. Investors believe this is the right way to go. So they are totally behind us. In fact, while we were we bought Laku Six recently in um, Indonesia, which is a, a company that inspects phones uh, with a mobile and AI software where you can actually determine the quality of the phone online and then we can decide how much to pay to the individual based on that without even meeting the individual. While doing it, we were able to raise from our existing investor 25 million US as a part of that whole deal because they believed in the model in what we were trying to do. So not only we um, got an acquisition, we raised money together with the acquisition to be able to do the deal. Yeah, so Amazon was notorious for losing money hand over fist for years and years and years. There's only been literally in the last few years that it started to turn a profit, right? Is it going to be different this time around for ASEAN e-commerce companies? Because I mean, I just saw Bukalapa's earnings. They're still slated to lose money for at least the next three years, and they're reasonably mature. C Limited is still losing money hand over fist for Shopee. Granted, they are paying for two other new other businesses as well, digital banking and I think gaming as well. Uh, you're a bit different, right? So. So just in terms of investor management, because at some point in time, your investors will say, okay, Gaurav, show me the money, right? When are you going to go listing and let me cash out or um, start making some profits so we can declare dividends? How, when, when? You know, how different is it going to be? Um, I can't comment about other companies, but I'll, I'll go into uh, ourselves per se. Um, so I think our investors are very clear with what we are doing. Uh, we are making money in some markets. The could we declare dividends or could we do something with that? Yes, it's possible. But we're deciding to invest that money in other markets and grow further. And that's a choice made with the investors together. So investors are not in a uh, hurry to get immediate return from us because they're seeing the long-term value of our business. And they're seeing that we can become a global player, if not just a regional player. So I think they're, they're in the long run for us. And we've not had that pressure from investors to say, I, I need an exit today, for example. So how long is long? <laughs> well, we've had some investors there from day one, right? Or from 10 years now, from uh, Secura, Rakutan, 500 startups. They're still investing with us. They're still as investors with, our, with us today. Okay. So um, we've got to talk about some other new... Well, I mean, America is the most, by far and away, the most matured e-commerce kind of landscape, right? So they're, quite, they're going very vertical now. Specific areas, specific segments. You are still very general, very horizontal. And, and that seems to be the play, the super app and, you know, all across the board, Grab is doing that, right? How does the ASEAN e-commerce landscape play out? What, what's your point of view? Um, so uh, this is a good question. We, we've tried to deliberate this quite a few times uh, internally. And uh, from our research and our findings and our experiences, U.S. is a bit of a different market. It's such a huge uh, market on its own that verticals can uh, exist profitably and create sustainable growth in that market. ASEAN is not that big from that perspective. So in ASEAN, you, in order to survive, in order to get your cost efficiencies, uh, a horizontal play is a much better way to do it. For example, in Malaysia, in, in Malaysia, if I look at the financials of, uh, say, iProperty in the past, Property Guru and uh, uh, Carless together, Muda made more money than three of them combined. Right? Because we were all in one, we could actually split our cost across the base. They had to invest equal amount in each of them. So, so there is a, uh, there's a certain efficiency that comes from a horizontal platform. That's one. Second, the users, when we survey the users and talk to users, users prefer to go to one place to do it. Users are not used to. So Asian users and Southeast Asian users particularly don't seem to prefer just each vertical for everything. Right? They do, they're open to looking at verticals, but they also prefer horizontal, one place that they can do a lot of things. So that, that is where I think we have an advantage, both from a cost perspective and also user preference is not just that I have to go for a vertical. I trust a brand, I trust him to do more than one vertical together, and I can go to them. 
So would you advise investors to raise as much as possible and expand as much as possible sideways and you know, all kinds of directions so to build in that resilience? And, and if, if so, if so, do you, do you relinquish majority share? You know, at, at what point in time do you say, okay, um, I'll give you majority. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll come down from 51%. Because it's very expensive, right, equity capital. What's your advice? Um, I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that, considering I'm not one of the founders for Carcel. Uh, but as a, um, maybe I still, I want to have some clarification on the question. Um, are you saying, when do you decide that you well, get well, diluted you, you, more? Well, you, you say there is, um, there is a proposition for having horizontals, right? Because you sure. can spread out your risk, right? Um, which then presupposes that you have the capital to expand sideways, right? Either by acquisitions or organically and fast, right? So, so then you need, a lot of, you need a lot of capital. So rather than, say, raise one million for what you need immediately, you might raise three or five you know, to go and grow even faster, right? By acquisition. So Actually, if then you the grow three and if you raise three and five, then then they're gonna say, okay, I want you know twenty percent, not not ten percent, or fifty percent, not forty percent. Uh, I, I think actually it's opposite because you can actually grow more in horizontals uh, at lower cost. So it isn't that you need more. So if you need to build three verticals versus build a horizontal with three verticals, you need less money. That's what we've discovered. Because the cost base is lesser, you use the same cost base for three different purposes, you can actually do more with less. Right? And that's what I'm trying to say here. That is where horizontals have a unique advantage. You don't need more to create more uh, horizontals. Correct, but then to, to, to expand horizontally, you need capital, right? To either grow it organically or by acquisition. Which means then, as a founder, as a manager, you need to raise more than necessary. Is that what you're advocating? No, I, I'm not advocating that. What I'm advocating is that users prefer this. There is a cost uh, advantage in this. Now, what uh, a founder wants to do, what a certain business model is a choice they have to make with their investors, right? And each of these, whether you go vertical or you go horizontal, there's a business in them. But it's a different kind of business. And there are different choices to make for each. In one, you're trying to go by creating a more um, a lot of users and you're lowering your acquisition costs because users are coming to your for same brand, but you may have less deeper experience within a vertical. Right? And those are deliberate choices you make. And each of them have business implications. Both are possible to do. We have chosen the horizontal path and we found success in it. Okay. So um, maybe a couple questions on the um, on, on the exit front, right? Because um, I mean, you know, Grab has done hasn't done great since listing, right? Bukalapa hasn't done great since listing. C Limited has really taken a nosedive. Um, how does that change the thinking process for someone like you, who works closely with top management, to think about what's my exit plan for my investors? How, how do we get to the next funding stage um, to get the best possible bank? How does you know, those three experiences from those three other companies inform your strategy going forward? Actually, just uh, this discussion we've had in different ways, it just entrenches our strategy currently. So it entrenches that go by going back to first principles is how you create value for users and how you're capturing value for users. So that becomes, still becomes the most important, and that's where you focus on. Because if we start, focus, start focusing on exits and valuations, et cetera, we'll never get it. So focusing on outcomes doesn't get you outcomes. Focusing on inputs gets you the outcomes. Okay, got some questions from the uh, online side, right? Um, Nick via Zoom, what's your three top, uh, top advice to startup entrepreneurs out there who are scaling their business? Um, what are the three top advices on yeah. scaling, is it? Yeah. So I think one is, are you in the right time to scale? Which means, are you, so you can either get growth by buying growth, or you can get growth that will have uh, that will organically grow after you buy people. So basically, um, do you have enough retention in your product? Do you have enough product market fit when you're investing in growth? So are you at the right time to scale up? So that's the first decision to make. If you're at the right time to scale up, yes. You need to invest some money, you need to invest in growth and getting users on board, because you'll be able to make them stick. 
But if you're just getting users every time by just buying them, then that's not, a, not most likely a sustainable model and you will die. Uh, we've been lucky, like most 80% of our traffic is uh, organic and direct. We don't invest that much. And it's been the case since always, I think. Uh, uh, having that product market fit to know when to scale is an important part. So I think that's one. Um, if you have that, the next is to prepare for, as you scale, certain processes will break. So you need to have the right people who can help you scale. So how do you invest in the right skill sets, of employees, of partners who can come in and help you scale. So it's really the people part that's most important. And the third part I would say is um, whatever you have thought on in terms of processes will break. Because whatever you, you were doing when you were 10 people or 20 people, the moment you become 50 or 100, it'll change. The moment you become 200, it'll change. If you become 400, it'll change. So just be aware that you will grow through these various S-curves of growth. and there will be a time when whatever you've done in the past, you have to forget and learn from it, but do different things. Because what you've done in the past will not help you succeed at the next level. So I think those three mindsets, um, or three things if you keep in mind, um, scaling should become easier. Easier, maybe not easy. <laughs> okay, Adam from Zoom. Uh, after having hit uni unicorn status, what's your advice to entrepreneurs to pick the right investors? I think we should answer this, but just, I guess, summarize, right? I, I think it is really people who believe in your strategic vision versus who are just willing to put money for the short term. How do you build a community, Aisha from Zoom, how do you build a community via an online marketplace? I, I guess it's for us, having a, uh, the belief has been always that uh, it is about solving user problems, right? So it's and also about creating a network effect uh, through those uh, by solving the problem. So how do you create enough demand and supply? How do you bring the right kind of um, right kind of users in uh, in the first stage who are going to help uh, be advocates for you? And how do you build from there? So it is a lot about uh, choosing. How do you go to market at every stage of your business? And if you're doing it right, you can build communities um, in the way you target them, the way you try and create the network effect. Matt Kelt's law, right? Okay. Um, what's the most interesting, uh, Kevin from Zoom, what's the most interesting marketing strategy that you've seen work in this country or region? It's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I would say the best marketing strategy I have seen succeed is a combination of where your marketing and product go hand in hand. They're not isolated. Your marketing is not talking about just convincing users to come on board and product is talking about something else. Where you can actually grow hack, which means your marketing and product teams, and I'm talking from a software perspective, software tech companies, if you can actually have them doing the same thing at the same time, that's where the magic happens. I don't understand. You have to explain that. Okay. Uh, a lot of times I've seen that marketing team has decided that I want to do this or build this brand. I'm going to get users in. This is the messaging I'm going to put across. But if that is not uh, reflected in the product that you have and the product team is not looking at the same things at the same point in time, uh, there's a, you may attract people in, but you are not able to give them the experience you're promising. So if you do the best marketing strategies I've seen succeed is when your product and marketing are working in harmony together, going to market with one strategy, with one uh, path forward. That's where I've seen most of the success happen. Yeah, it's, it's the brand promise, right? Don't brand tell me promise, one thing and not do just from a marketing point of view. I think it's, I've seen a lot of time brand gets relegated to a brand team in marketing. Brand is the responsible for everybody in the company. Yeah, yeah, okay. Robbie from Zoom. Would you be an entrepreneur again if you had another chance? Well, I would definitely love to try it again. And what would you do? <laughs> try and avoid all the mistakes I made the last time. And what were those mistakes? Well, the first one was that uh, I tried to go it alone, <laughs> try to do it everything myself, uh, try to bootstrap everything without getting the right partnerships and the right uh, founders in place. I, I would first step look at the right 
uh, co-founders with me. So in order of priority, what are the three most important things you did wrong at the time? Went alone. Um, tried to do two things instead of one. Um, did not plan for a certain time with no income, spending all my money, etc. Um, with having children go into international schools in a place like Singapore, not having citizenship and others in that country, not knowing when I would be asked to leave the country. I did not plan for those things. So personal choices, having the right set of founders, um, and, uh, and really uh, focusing on one thing that, uh, that could potentially succeed. So what's your background, and what kind of co-founders would have worked for you? Uh, at that time, my background was uh, literally marketing and media. What would have succeeded is uh, competency that was complementary to me. Uh, I, I would say definitely in the technology and the product space, and uh, to a certain extent also in um, customer management uh, part. I think those kind of three founders, uh, kind of a group of three, would have been uh, a good way to start to be able to bounce of different ideas, different perspectives, uh, from three different point of views, from three different experiences. So just one more question on the uh, co-founder part, right? Um, how, other than competencies, right, what other things must you have to find the right co-founder? Because you're gonna spend a lot of time around them and you need to almost like them, right? <laughs> Even though you're working together. I think somewhere you, you, you need to be, um, you need to believe in it, have some trust in each other. Uh, there has to be a bit of uh, um, belief in the longer term vision of what you're trying to do and a commitment that we will say face a lot of problems, a lot of disagreements, but we have to persevere together. That upfront agreement is quite important because over period time I have at least found a lot of uh, people who failed with the co-founders just because the other person could not persevere or could not be around for um, or had a total disagreement and they came in the first place with very different expectations. Somebody wanted to, um, was thinking this was a two year gig and something would materialize within that. Another person was thinking it'll take six years. Right. So depending of having very similar vision, uh, but breaking it down to some more specifics so that you can have a um, better idea of what it means versus conceptual things uh, would potentially help uh, see if you are all on the same page. A mirror from Zoom. How will non-financial data like social media, gaming, e-commerce, and other such data points influence credit scoring and eligibility for financial services in the near future? Could these alternative data be used to further increase financial inclusions for the underserved communities? I, I do believe yes. The problem about financial uh, communities today is that uh, they do not get uh, access to finances because they do not have a good finance. Good is they don't have a history, and what has been seen is that there's data points on people's behavior that can actually um, give indication of their creditworthiness, and if that indeed can be proven, um, there are models that can be created, and they are being created worldwide today, uh, where creditworthiness is not based on their past credit history; they're based on their other behaviors which are, have been found to be very good signals of their ability to pay back, ability to do, um, ability to encourage right behavior, um, and I think is definitely possible because it's succeeding across the world today. Is that something that you, know, you guys at Carousel are doing? No, we, we are not doing that today, but uh, I see that happening in Southeast Asia quite a bit right now. Okay, um, Lokman from Zoom. So with a recession coming, what should startups in Malaysia be wary of and what opportunities uh, should they keep an eye out for? I think first thing to be wary of is what is your cash at hand, right? So if you cannot survive uh, and you don't have business, so finding where you can cut corners now to be able to save that you should spend on the right things, uh, I think is an important aspect. If you already have a market fit and you can actually grow at this time and have sustainable growth, then 
by all means spend. But I think the biggest thing to think is, can you survive the recession? If you can, you invest in the right places. If you can't survive, you can't be a cockroach, you won't be around, around to actually take the benefit of what happens once the recession goes away. Okay. And uh, thus wraps our session, uh, Q&A. We'd like to open the door for...